tonight we are advancing in our studies about doctrines, important doctrines. We went through some examples the last two Sundays, but tonight I want to talk about the greatest commandments and the least commandments. Commandments great and small, at least as much as we perceive them. Now the word of God is filled with ordinances and commandments. Faith has a set of do's and don'ts. The New Testament is filled with imperatives and interdictions. And yes, there are some traditions, and unashamedly, we accept that we have traditions. Now, I heard a lot of bashing on traditions. That's Romanian traditions. You think Americans don't have any? When you want to replace, and I emphasize a replace our traditions, you will adopt other traditions. Let me give you an example. Um, when we come to the pulpit, and at the end of the service, all of us here, we kneel down. And uh, recently, in a Romanian church, they had a scandal in the leadership of the church. Can you believe it? Why should they kneel down when they, the, the service ends? Because they're already praying at the end of the service. So that's a prayer after prayer. As far as I'm concerned, we can have prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer. But even in the beginning of the service, when we go to the pulpit, some people don't kneel. And that's fine. But the question is, is it a good or is it a bad tradition? I think it's good. It shows to the people that we are here not on our own power, and qualities, but depending on God to inspire us and to use us. And at the end of the service, we kneel because we want you to understand that we are glorifying God for whatever success we may have enjoyed. It's due to God, not to us. Our traditions are the way we do things. It's methodology, it's applicability. It responds to the question how, not if and or why. And it's a matter of leadership sometimes. We do things in a certain way because we are in positions of authority to implement our principles in such ways. Now, Again, in Romanian, we have an expression. Uh, there might be people with different customs and traditions. And while we are not saying about other people's traditions that they're bad, we have ours. And we have a right to have ours as they have a right to have theirs. And we believe ours are good customs, are good traditions. Because everything that is spiritual, everything that is prayerful, everything that shows our dependency 
on God and the power of the Holy Spirit is a good tradition. Now, I know some people would say that's hypocritical, that's just showing. I mean, we have to show something. We don't live in a void. We are under scrutiny. People see us. So what do you want to see? If I don't act spiritual, because that's hypocritical. You want me to lay down on these three chairs and just put my feet up? Huh? I know some of you come to the house of the Lord and just sit like this, very uh, leisurely. Yeah, it's fine. But we don't portray that in the house of the Lord. Our behavior, our customs, our traditions show our respect in the house of God for our Lord and Savior. So, yes, we have commandments. We have big and small, greatest and least of commandments. They're in the Bible. So what are we going to do with them? Now, I'm going to read two verses, the doctrine of small commandments, or the least of these commandments. Matthew 5, 19 and 20, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so. You've heard lately a lot of preachers saying, Nah, that's okay. That's, that's, we can get away with that. It's not important. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now there's a, an equation for big and small commandments. Luke 16, 10, one who is faithful in a very little is faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Now commandments are given to protect us from sin. That's why we have boundaries, restrictions, and imperatives, do's and don'ts, so that we are pleasing to the Lord, doing his will, and avoiding sin. About sin, the ultimate offense against God. Now we know in our initial state of creation, we were perfect. But we were created with free will. We have desires, choices, decisions, and also responsibilities. Free will implies choices, good versus evil, and consequences for those choices. Now there's knowledge and understanding, awareness of acts and consequences. When you have a commandment, from God. Remember the Garden of Eden? The moment you shall eat from the fruit, you will die. There was a clear commandment, restriction, and a clear consequence. They were aware. Now we have conscience, the conscience in our hearts. And based on our conscience, which was put in us by God through his spirit. We are born with a conscience. 
We are aware when something is evil. We have this contradiction of thoughts in our minds, Romans chapter 2. And by that, we prove that the law of God had been built in when we were created. Premeditation and conspiracy. To commit a sin, you have to premeditate it and conspire to commit it. That's why most people that sin are going into the darkness. We've heard it at the beginning of the service. They run away from light. And there is a level of pride in sinning that voids repentance. Because the solution that God offers us is repentance. So we have a problem with sin. Restrictions, imperatives, commandments are given so that we are pleasing to God, doing his will, avoiding sin. What are the depths of Satan, the culture of the angels, and the doctrines of demons? They are resumed in first falsehoods about God, questioning his authority. You remember in the Garden of Eden, because that's where it all started. Satan challenged the authority of who, who does he think he is to give you commandments? Now, sometimes when we preach the word of God here, some people are challenging our authority. But Paul said, we have absolutely no authority outside of the word of God that we preach. Our authority does not come from ourselves. We do not impose ourselves as figures of authority outside of the authority given to us by the word of God. That's where our authority lays. So questioning his authority, questioning his goodness, God is not that good. He doesn't want you to do well. He doesn't want you to be fulfilled. He's keeping something from you. And then questioning his honesty and motivation. He doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to experience being God. And then false hopes about self, being like God. We live in a society filled with this concept and unfortunately even within Christianity we have that false doctrine of becoming ourselves a deity becoming little gods with access to the word logos kind of word which creates oh we're roaming around this earth Imposing the kingdom of God by our speaking, whatever we want to take place. We don't have access to that, brothers and sisters. That is the word of creation. We have Rema, we have the word with the spirit to bring about that change and to bring the kingdom of God inside of us. The only way we are spreading the kingdom is by conversion, converting other souls to the Lord and they themselves becoming territories of the kingdom of God. Ultimate fulfillment beyond and without God. You don't need God to be fulfilled. And full independence. Now we have free will. But we don't have full independence. By creation, God is our master. And we have to submit to him willingly, voluntarily. If we don't, there are consequences. He allows us. Free will, but not without consequences. So don't confuse free will with full independence. You know what Paul said? You don't do whatever you want. You have one choice to make, actually. Either you accept God and Jesus as your savior, or you reject him. Once you do that, 
you're either following Christ and doing his will and everything that you do is preordained because we are walking in the deeds that he had already prepared for us Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 if we don't accept Jesus that doesn't mean we are independent the Bible says that we are mastered by evil we fall into the trap of Satan and the whole world lays like dead being mastered by Satan controlled by Satan so that's what the admonition of Paul is don't give your members don't give your body as slaves of sin to be used by the devil but give yourself to the Lord and once you make that one decision you're not yours anymore so this is a false hope about self Satan promises you the lie of full independence there's no such thing now when we talk about the depths of Satan in Revelation and the doctrines of demons in uh, Timothy we kind of understand what it is all about but the culture of the angels and we're talking about good angels and bad angels the culture of the angels of God the good angels is the culture of obedience the culture of demons is the culture of rebellion and disobedience there are two cultures angels have free will too Satan chose to disobey and rebel he corrupted one-third of the angels to follow him and these all are demons their culture See, when we talk about culture, it's the kind of music we sing, it's the kind of dress code we have. Uh, the, 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 we're talking about culture, right? Poetry, literature, so many things belong to culture. When you talk about the culture of angels, you talk about the culture of demons and the culture of God's angels, which is only rebellion and disobedience when it comes to Satan and his angels, obedience and submission when it comes to God's angels so how does the devil compromise and mitigate through doctrine small commandments versus great commandments it puts in our head that um, there are some commandments that are not that important because they are small they pertain to the small things yeah you talk about adultery you talk about killing someone those are great commandments are a part of the Ten Commandments but you know attending church regularly being punctual being you know we're human those are little things we think we can get away with little things and we created that kind of understanding even in our families okay this time but don't let it repeat so we divide that's that doesn't come from God when we divide commandments between small and great commandments then principles versus opinions and what I'm seeing nowadays a lot of principles are thrown into the category of opinions that's his opinion that's opinion that's not the principle we talked about what makes it a principle a principle then personal preference versus obedience 
uh, we think that God is giving us a lot of space for preferences, and there are some preferences, yes. But ultimately, let's not disobey God, thinking that we have too much room for preferences. Personal experience versus truth. We cannot substitute our personal experiences for the truth of the word of God. I heard recently about somebody that doesn't like when the church gathers for Staruinsun. Our prayer gathering where we ask God to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. And that person offered, well, I was baptized uh, during a song. So because that person was baptized during a song in church, that person wants everybody to be baptized during a song in church, so we just sing songs. I'm giving you just a little example of how we can substitute personal experience versus truth. Pride versus repentance. We believed something for a long time. That's how we grew up, with this kind of an understanding. And at some point, the Bible is explained to us. We understand that this is the truth, but can we throw our leg backwards into the thorn? That's what Jesus asked Paul at his conversion. Would you be willing to throw your leg back into a thorn? That is to understand that everything you have believed about Christ is wrong and you have to start anew. Some people would not accept the truth of the gospel in some of the commandments that we find in the Bible, not because it's not the truth, not because the Bible doesn't say it, but because of pride. I don't want to admit that I was wrong. You can put the truth and divide it in small portions and make it as clear as possible. They will not accept it. And their last argument would be, yeah, you didn't convince me. Oh, okay. Well, for fun. You're not very convincing. Okay. But it's black on white. Oh, yeah, no. Nah. Okay. I can argue with ignorance. But I cannot argue with intentional disobedience. And then misinterpretation versus submissiveness. Sometimes it's easier to misinterpret the passage than to just submit. I was talking about, of, about the washing of the feet of the saints at our first communion this year. And it's so hard when you misinterpret it, you know? You have to say, it's only once in the Bible. It was a cultural thing, washing the feet. Instead of, wouldn't it be easier just to submit and obey and practice it? Just do it. That's it. Wouldn't send you to hell. If you obey, if you submit, and if you practice it. You're not going to go to hell because of that. But if it's black on white, on the Bible, in the Bible, and you disobey. What about that? So careful with misinterpretation. The different methods of demon presence, it's demon influence, covert, undercover, camouflage, suggestions. Do you remember when David counted the people and his armies? It was a suggestion from the devil. And he did not respect the law, which had a ritual for that specific purpose. 
Demon oppression, depression, torment, dark thoughts. Remember Saul? He was tormented by a demon. And then you have demon possession, annihilation, and replacement of human identity. Now remember, the most common way in which demons act in our world is through influence. Through influence. You don't have a lot of people possessed. For a person to be possessed, you either need a very, very powerful demon, like those that took possession of men's body to create the giants before the flood. Those were demons so powerful, when they took control of a person, they possessed the person, annihilate their identity and use that body for their purpose. Now, there's not enough gray demons. In some instances, you see the uh, demon possessed from Gadara. It was a legion of them. Many demons occupying one body. They put together their power to suppress that person's identity. But there are not enough gray demons or demons at large to possess all the people on, in this world. So they are picking and choosing on that. But the most frequent way in which demons operate in this world is through suggestions, through influence. That's why we need to search our minds, guard our minds, and make every thought submissive to the Lord. This is what we need to do. Because some of the thoughts in our minds are not from God, are not from the Holy Spirit. Even David fell prey to a suggestion like this, disobeying God. The agents of demonic doctrines are marked and irreversibly condemned, says the Gospel. Because not only they're rebelling and disobeying God, but they teach other people, they influence other people to do the same. How ignoring small commandments create a culture of disobedience. No immediate and visible consequences. You come to church, you disobey the Lord, Come to church and you still pray and you still sing and you still like the service. It seems like nothing happened and God is not striking you dead because he has patience for your repentance. That's his desire. Imagine every time you disobey God or someone would disobey God, he would strike him dead or make him very sick. I, I don't even want to think about that. You remember when we had kind of weak services because it was very cold and a lot of people were sick. I, I, I see that many of you recovered, praise the Lord. But imagine if every time you disobey a commandment of God, you would be killed, disabled, you would have a sickness. I don't know how many of us would show up on a given Sunday. Thank God for his patience, long-suffering patience with us. No immediate abandonment by God's presence. You see, even when Saul made his first mistake, God did not abandon him immediately. You still feel it. This is one of the traps that we experience. We sin and then we come to church and we shed a few tears and say, oh, I've still got it. It means that God doesn't care about what I did. No. God is not immediately abandoning you. 
compensatory experiences. Um, we're talking about nowadays women promotion and ordination for men's only positions of authority. And you hear the sermon and you say, well, I guess the sister is full of the Holy Spirit. She's saying good things. She's preaching so well. How can you argue with success? And yet it is a clear disobedience and rebellion against God's rule. Sisters, let me make a small parenthesis here because it seems like it's a small commandment. Unless you recite poems and sing songs and maybe witness to something that happened in your life, a miracle, something that happened to you. You cannot set doctrine and teaching in the presence of men, and we understand that older sisters should teach younger sisters how to be good wives and good Christian girls and wives. That's fine. We understand that. But in the assembly of God, even if you have a question, the Bible says you're not going to address it. You're going to go to your husband at home and say, husband, I have a question. And the husband is going to bring the question in the assembly of the church. That's black on white in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Read it. If you don't know about it, you didn't read it. Read it. Go home and read it. There are some limitations. But the sermon is great. The teaching is phenomenal. Beats many men in that position. Yet it is a clear disobedience and rebellion against God's commandments. Sorry, but that's the Bible. But because we feel it, because it's interesting, because it's good, because she's smart, we say, well, maybe God doesn't take that commandment very seriously. Be very careful. Be very, very careful. Preaching and teaching these small doctrines are made out to be mere human rules, legalistic and personal obsessions. I talked to a pastor, I visited the church, and I said, I think you have some problems in your church. I, I, I think people are dressing inappropriately. I think, I think you have to work with some things here. And he said, brother, I'm not preaching rags. Well, the Bible says a lot of things about rags, from Genesis to Revelation. It talks about clothes and rags a lot. So I'm not saying only preach about that, but every now and then you have to address and preach about what the Bible says in every aspect because at the end remember Paul when he went to prison and to death the last thing he said to the church I had not kept anything from you as far as the complete teaching of the Word of God is concerned I've preached about everything Now, when you talk about legalism, be very careful with that because this is a word crafted to say that we should not preach commandments and rules and ordinances and restrictions in the church. Be careful with that because the law, and I know people employ a lot of verses against the law, but everywhere with Paul talks against the law. He talks about the ritual law. Circumcision, Sabbath, animal sacrifices, 
kinds of food that we should eat or not. It talks about the ritual law. Everywhere it talks about the moral law, it is even narrower than in the old. And where it talks about the charitable law, it is strengthened because we don't have to love our neighbor as ourselves. We need to love our neighbor as we love Jesus. Slowly but surely, every doctrine will be challenged, even the greater ones, moral, ethical, and functional. And you see it, brothers and sisters. We started low and slow. It was about this little thing and that little thing. And now you go by churches where you see the rainbow. Proudly saying, all are welcome. If they can justify that iniquity, that immorality, and they do it successfully nowadays in this society, we have more and more laws. I'm, I'm, I'm shivering waiting for a law that would say that we cannot reject somebody from baptism or from communion or from membership that lives that kind of a lifestyle. Careful because little by little, false doctrine infiltrates and ignoring small commandments, if we set the front, if we wage our battle inside our territory, it will come closer and closer and every barricade that we abandon will not bring peace and will not stop the war. It will just move closer and closer to home. In the end, if eternal damnation won't come because of disobedience in small ways or commandments, will come because of ultimately leading to breaking all commandments. And look at the equation here. James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You cannot pick and choose. You, net, you cannot go in front of God with lists. I broke these few little commandments, but hey, I've obeyed on these greatest of them. Careful with this kind of a, an analysis. You look at Matthew 5, the context and follow-up of the verses we read in the beginning. Hate equals murder. Lust equals adultery. And we say, well, what a, I had a thought. I, I, I looked. It's not a sin to do. I didn't do anything more. Hate equals murder. Lust equals adultery. Resentment towards your neighbor equals the breaking the relationship with God. Honest talk is better than an oath. And false witness is inconceivable. Turn the cheek, help all, and love your enemies. Now we break some of these commandments with impunity. Many times. And we think, yeah, but I didn't do this, and this, and this. Which are the greatest of them all. So I should be okay. See how little commandments, small commandments, least of these commandments are considered by Christ. This is the context and the follow-up of who shall break these commandments, shall become guilty of them all. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to say something about this. It's 8.04 and I'm going to go fast, fast through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because this is the smallest of commandments, right? 
the, the list of the commandments. The list. I, 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 no, I, I'm going to correct myself. Is the least of the least of the least of the least of all the commandments. But it's in the Bible as black on white, written down, and let's see if we interpret it correctly or not. First Corinthians 11, verse 2. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions. Oh my Lord, Paul, what are you doing, man? <laughs> the two traditions. Oh, so many people never read the Bible. Just as I pass them on to you. Who do you think you are? But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man. And pay attention to this, please. A lot of people are accusing us to applying these verses to women. Tonight, we're going to apply them to men. And we're going to make a lot of men unhappy. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. His head being Christ. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, that means cut all your hair or even shave it. But it's the same thing. It's not degrees of having more or less hair. That is between men and women. Women should have longer hair, men should have shorter hair. When it comes to either cut or shaved, it means no hair, period. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Now, remember, what is the culture of the angels? Because a lot of people talk about the culture of the Corinthians. What was the culture of the Corinthians? I don't care. It doesn't say here about that culture. It talks about the culture of the angels because of the angels. Angels have two different cultures. The angels of God, a culture of obedience and submission. The angels of Satan, a culture of rebellion and disobedience. These are the two cultures of the angels. And it's biblical. Throughout the Bible, you're going to find this. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Verse 13. Judge for yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things by creation teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her, to her as a covering. Remember, a covering, not the covering. And we'll cover that immediately, no pun intended. If anyone wants to be contentious about it, we have no other practice. We have no other practice, no other choice. 
nor do the churches of God. Now, black and white, written in the scriptures in the New Testament by Apostle Paul, the supposed champion of liberal causes, it has created great controversy in the churches of all denominations. It is contentious and divisive. Therefore, it has to be addressed. It has to be addressed. First of all, it is about prayer and or prophecy. Prayer and prophecy is part of our personal and corporate worship and devotion. It has to be deliberate and organized. It is not necessarily applicable 24-7. Because there are people that say that you should go shopping with your head covered. You should uh, wash yourself. You, you, you should cook. You should, I mean, maybe you, you should cook with something on your head to protect your hair, but the food more likely, but listen, uh, it is not a 24-7 thing. It is for prayer and prophesying for the act of worship and corporate devotion or personal devotion. Yet a woman should always be prepared for the opportunity because she always carries a purse. What would a woman do without a purse? I've never seen women without purses. And they have everything in that purse. There's nothing missing from that purse. You cut yourself, you're bleeding, she has something for it. I mean, you might be hungry, she might have something for it. Everything is on a woman purse. And I think a little piece of cloth would fit just fine among so many other things. And it will not make it much more heavier, right? So I would be prepared. I mean, take a napkin, OK? Take a napkin. But it is as much about men as it is about women. And we'll see to that. Is it one or are there two coverings? Long hair is given to her as a covering. Long hair is also given to men. You know, men can have long hair. Yet they have to pray without covering their heads should they get rid of the natural covering, which is hair, shave their heads. Now, let me say something to the wonderful, sensational, nice preachers that give this indulgence to the women. You can pray without your hair, uh, head covered. Just hair, that's, that's the covering. Because men cannot pray with their head covered, and we are only talking about hair. Be honest now, don't switch on me. When we talk about women, you already said, it's just about the hair. Now, Mr. Men, I know you're wrong, but at least be honest. Shave your head. All the men, and not because you have to, OK? Not because you have to. All the men that preach that women do not need to have another cover over their heads because the hair is the covering. In the same passage, it says that men cannot pray with their heads covered. So shave your heads and then preach about it. You're still wrong. You're still unbiblical. You're still misinterpreting the Bible, but at least you're honest. Because if you do not do that, then I know who you are. You're just catering to the feelings of people. You're just pre pre preaching to please people. And you don't care about their souls. So let me repeat it. Is, if the only covering we're talking about here is the hair. It applies to women, fine. So 
So they don't need another covering, it's just the hair. But it has to apply to men too. And when it applies to men, praying with hair on their heads is dishonoring their head, which is Christ. So shave your heads. Shave your heads, dear preachers. Or keep your mouth shut and study the Bible some more. And don't throw your doctorates and uh, your experience uh, in our faces and your history lessons about the Corinthians. All right. I feel better. If only needed for devotion and not 24-7, which is clearly stated in the passage. That is, if women should cover their heads when praying, prophesying, and it's only about hair, unless they cut or shave their heads, why not just say women should not cut, shave their heads and be done with it? Keep your hair long. That's it. And we covered everything. We cover people's sensitivity. Because it's not, it's unbecoming for a woman to be with her head cut, hair cut or shaved. And it covers the prayer and devotion too. You don't need to talk about cover your heads. I mean, what, what would they do? Keep their hair in their purse? And when they pray and prophesy, put their hair on? You see, it's irrational. If they don't want to cover their heads, why should they cut, shave their heads? Since it is implied that by not covering their heads with hair, that has been already happened. One of the so-called explanations is that it involved the culture of the Corinthians. But the text mentions two reasons, common sense, and human culture, which states, don't cut and don't, don't shave your head, and don't cut your hair. As to why women should have long hair, and angels for the second covering, a piece of cloth, the added on covering. Girls under the authority of their father, women under the authority of their husbands. Head covering is a sign of submission to authority, otherwise the head is dishonored. Head covering is a sign of protection against evil in the spiritual world. Women are more vulnerable to deceit and emotions. They should be kept under authority, and there is a sign of that authority whenever they go into the spiritual dimension through prayer and prophesying, they should have that sign of authority. The most ridiculous and cheap excuse is my church does not require it. Well, your church didn't die for you and uh, the commandments are not the commandments of your church. They are the commandments of God and they are in the Bible. The church should believe what the Bible says. The Bible should not change according to what your church does or believes. My husband does not mind, encourages me to not wear it. Well, you are saved by Christ, not through your husband, but directly. And you are responsible to the word of God and you obey your husband in the Lord, not outside the Lord's commandments. Matthew 19, 7 to 12, the Pharisees asked, then why did Moses give a command Allowing a man to divorce his wife by writing a certificate of divorce. Jesus answered, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because you refused to accept God's teaching. But divorce was not allowed in the beginning. I tell you that whoever divorces his wife except for the problem of sexual sin and marries another woman is guilty of adultery. So you see, they brought Moses against Christ and say, see, even Moses recognized some realities. People didn't want to obey. They wanted to divorce. And Jesus said, well, maybe Moses gave you that exception because of your hardening your hearts 
and rebellion and disobedience. But how did that serve you over the centuries? How much good did that do to you? How are you faring now? Creating a culture of disobedience amongst your people. Starting with that. God never changed. His commandments is still the same. And Jesus sides with God, not with the disclaimer that Moses gives. Since everybody does it, what can we do? You know, when a rule is discarded, when more people disobey than obey. Let me tell you, sisters, if by any chance, talking to each other, conspiring, one Sunday, you would all come without a head covering. I would look at you, and I'd say, two, four, six, one, two, three, I don't have enough soldiers to imprison you. Even in society, rules and commandments fall when people disobey en masse. So I would say, okay, this is my last day as the pastor of this church, or I'm going to compromise my beliefs, which if I do, then next Sunday, because you've learned the lesson, you're going to jump on the next barricade and say, now we want earrings. And all of a sudden, most women, you know, I, I, I hope this is a spirit. I, I truly believe that the women in this church are spiritual and obedient women. Um, sometimes I ask myself, if one Sunday we say anything goes, what would you do, holy women of God? You'll say, well, <laughs> nice. Let's go shopping. I'd have at least a few husbands angry at me, obviously. And not because of the indulgence, probably, it's because of pocket reasons. But hey, I don't ask you to be obedient to us. I ask you to be obedient to the Lord. And Let's go further. What about women that wear head coverings and are not obedient to their husbands? Are sinning, even being guilty of adultery? Trust me, Batiku is not guilty of that. Batiku cannot commit adultery. And the Batik is not disobedient. Never. Don't mix the commandments. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the head covering. That's one commandment, and not committing adultery is another commandment. Don't you, this is circular argument. It's just rags. Well, rags are important too. Because tomorrow, I mean, I went to Florida once at a convention, and while driving, I went by a church who said, beach clothes allowed. Do you think that rags are not important? It's just a small piece of ordinary bread. Tomorrow you're going to say that about the Holy Communion. It's just a piece of cloth. It's just a little piece of bread. It's just a sip of ordinary grape juice. It's just a basin of water. An immersion. A bath. It's just a smudge of oil. That's what we're going to do with all these supposedly small commandments. Because we've already learned to disobey and to rebel. 1 Samuel 15, 23, disobedience is as bad as the sin of sorcery. Pride is as bad as the sin of worshiping idols. You have rejected the Lord's command. Now he rejects you as king, said Samuel to Saul. The three alternatives on head covering. 
Now, in the middle, you have the default state. A normal woman with hair. That's the default state. That's how you are born, and that's how you grow up. The left side, you have a woman with no hair, her hair cut, her head shaved. On the right side, you have head covering. Now, the three alternatives of men had covering. The left side, you have the default. If you don't cut your hair, that's how you're going to be. The right side is a man with short hair, as it should be. In the middle, you have the worshiping men, praying and prophesying men, if hair is the only covering. If women only need long hair as covering and not having a hair covering means having her hair cut shaved, why should she cut shave their hair if they don't have hair to begin with? Now look at this. On the left side, you have a woman that doesn't want to cover her head if the hair is the covering, if only hair is the covering. So the Bible says, if she doesn't want to cover her hair, if she's like that, then she should be like that. What is she doing between those two states? She already doesn't have hair. She's already shaved her head. But if she does not cover her head, and that means shaving her head, because hair is the only covering, then she should shave her head. Is that rational to you? Obviously not. No. The Bible says, you are like that and you should be like that, with hair on your head, because it's the natural covering given by God. If you do not do what is on the right side when you pray and prophesy, you don't cover your head, then you should do what's on the left side, shave your head. Because you have something to shave, it's the hair. There are two coverings, brothers and sisters, the natural covering and the additional covering for prayer and prophesying for devotion. Now, ask yourself, how much did God cover with a natural covering? It has to be visible and meaningful, cannot be confused for jewelry, and cannot become the victim of circumstances and abuses. And let me say a few words about that, and uh, we're at the end of it. Thank God. Trust me. I hate to do this as much as you hate to hear it, but I have to do it, at least now and then. I heard a lot of disclaimers and specific circumstances about doctrines. For example, the thief on the cross had not been baptized, had never taken communion, and had not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. He never spoke in tongues. Can he be used as a reason for somebody not getting baptized, not taking communion, and not being filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you use the thief on the cross? Yes. Yes, of course. We'll bring a cross next Sunday, especially for you. We'll crucify you, and you don't need baptism, you don't need the Holy Spirit, you don't need anything if you are the thief on the cross. But if you're not the thief on the cross, you have the opportunity to come to church, you come to the baptismal courses. We have a baptism in the church. You have no reason not to get baptized. We have Holy Communion every month. You take communion. Some people say, well, what if I'm in prison and I don't have bread and I don't have 
Grape juice. I cannot take communion. Don't I have life and salvation? Using these specific situations to demolish a doctrine is very harmful. Dear ladies, you came to church tonight to worship God according to his will and his word. We respectfully ask that you cover your heads. Now I understand there are different degrees and I'm not going to measure inches, but it has to be visible, obviously. But cover your heads. Obey God. We cannot enforce anything like that beyond that line, but we are going to enforce it on the platform. Because this is a privilege, this is not a right. But we ask respectfully that you obey the scriptures. And you don't throw sand in our eyes like those lame excuses that I've mentioned earlier. Because in the end, let me be wrong, Paul said once, let me be wrong and let God be right. If you don't need to cover your head, and you do, that's not a sin. You're not going to go to hell for that. But if the Bible says it, and it does, and if the Bible requires it, and it does, and if we are teaching it in this church, and we do, and you fall into disobedience and rebellion, no, you're not going to go to hell because you didn't put a piece of cloth on your head I don't read in the Bible, those that don't cover their heads shall go to hell. I don't see a Bible verse that says, those that are not speaking in tongues shall go to hell. No. But if it is an imperative, that you shall wear a head covering. And you shall pray for the filling and baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you do, you obey. Because yes, people are going to hell for rebellion and disobedience. So every small commandment or commandment is attached to being obedient or disobedient. And once you start being disobedient, look at your children, learn from your children. They never start with the big things. When they're disobedient, they always start small. And then it escalates. The more indulgent, the more permissive you are, the more they break your rules until you have none. And you know what the default state of many parents is? Ah, we were kids too. We did all these things too. And what are you going to do? Kids are kids. Brothers and sisters. I don't find pleasure in uh, making you feel uncomfortable. I am not saying these things because of a conspiracy to subjugate women. Lord knows, and I can have some witnesses here, we love you very much. And there's little you cannot do with us when you treat us nicely. We are not asking you to do things because in this church we have a tradition 
or a culture for it. We ask you to do this, to stay obedient to God and for your prayers and for your worship to be acceptable to God. I know there will be a time when it's minus 20 degrees outside and I have a hat and I cannot take it off because I'm going to freeze. And I know you're not going to have your piece of cloth on your head and you're driving and you see a car cutting your way and you say, Lord, and you're praying for God's help. And oh my God, you don't have a head covering. Let's not use these extremes the specific situations. You didn't come here just as a blunder or by accident. You knew you were coming to the house of the Lord. You knew you were coming here to pray and worship. So I ask respectfully and with love and appreciation that all the ladies in this church would obey the Bible. Thank you very much. Let's stand and pray for the power to obey. And it might not be a very powerful prayer, but let, be, let it be a sincere and honest prayer.